He created the universe To Him belong the heavens and the earth The ever-living, He is the first He's the owner of mercy He sent His messengers To all His creatures Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا إنه من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد ما دير brothers and sisters in Islam today we'll be continuing chapter number two of كتاب التوحيد إمام ترمذي reports from أنس رضي الله عنه he heard Allah's messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم saying and this hadith is Hassan hadith. The degree of this hadith is Hassan. Remember, we mentioned in the previous chapter that the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, two categories, traceable and untraceable. The traceable, Sahih and Hassan. Sahih and Hassan. So this the hadith is Hassan hadith, which is in Tirmidhi. Qala Allah Azza wa Jal, Yabn Adam, لو أتيتني بقراب الأرض خطايا ثم لقيتني لا تشرك بي شيئا لأتيتك بقرابها مغفرة Allah the most exalted said O son of Adam were you to come to me with the world full of sins and meet me without making anything partner to me I would come to you with a similar amount of forgiveness. This is Hadith Qudsi. Because the Hadith are two types. Hadith Nabawi and Hadith Qudsi. Prophetic Hadith and Qudsi Hadith, sacred Hadith. So how many types? Two. Hadith Qudsi, when the Prophet ﷺ says, Allah said, like this one. This is Hadith Qudsi. Hadith Nabawi, the normal hadith we read. They are hadith Nabawi. But the moment the Prophet ﷺ says, Allah said, this is hadith Qudsi. So what is the difference between hadith Qudsi and Quran? The Quran, the meaning and the words from Allah. Hadith Qudsi, the meaning from Allah and the words from the Prophet. So the Prophet ﷺ, he gets the inspiration and then he phrases it in his own words. Are you following? And then he attributes it to Allah. Allah says this. The Quran you can read in the Salah. Hadith Qudsi you cannot read in the, in the Salah. So this Hadith talks about the vastness of Allah's mercy and forgiveness. That if you come to Allah with sins that they fill the whole planet, the whole earth, the whole world, and then you don't associate any partner with Allah, Allah will forgive all of this. So the only sin that Allah will not forgive is the shirk. Anything else, Allah will forgive. That's why we Muslims, Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, we don't consider a Muslim who is a sinner, irrespective of the sin that he's committing, that he is not Muslim. He is still a Muslim. Alcoholic is a Muslim. A person committing zina is a Muslim. He committed a fornication, adultery, he's a Muslim. A person who killed someone is still a Muslim. He killed himself, he's still a Muslim. Are you following? And we give him burial wash and we make janaza and his wife has to go through the idda, the waiting period, and his children will inherit him, etc. He's a Muslim. The man who killed himself 
at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. He killed himself. He committed suicide. The Prophet ﷺ did not perform janazah. He didn't pray janazah. But he told the Sahaba, Sallu ala sahibikum. You pray janazah. That means Muslim or non-Muslim. He's a Muslim. He allowed the Sahaba to pray the janazah. But he didn't pray to teach the people that if someone killed himself, he has committed a grave, major sin, and he is going to be a loser. I'm not going to pray for him. This is a great loss that the Prophet uh, doesn't pray over you. But it doesn't mean if someone kills himself, he's not a Muslim. The same thing, someone who's drinking alcohol. What is the punishment for him in Islam? We lash him, right? That's it. So he's a Muslim. Someone stole. He's still a Muslim. Is this clear to you? So as long as you don't associate and commit shirk with Allah, it's up to Allah. That is up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you. When we pray in janazah, we ask Allah forgiveness for you. It's up to Allah if he wants to punish you or to forgive you. But you are a Muslim. Is this clear? And now, alhamdulillah, we finished chapter number two. And inshallah, we open the floor, inshallah, for questions. Questions should be related to the topic. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. What we have summarized from this chapter number two, does it mean that Islam permits to commit sins just because you believe in Allah? Does Islam permit to commit sins? You mean the hadith? That Allah forgives the sins even if they reach the clouds. No, it doesn't mean that. This shows the greatness of Allah. This shows the rahmah of Allah. That Allah will forgive you your sins even if they reach the clouds. Which means this will give you hope not to despair and not to give up. So the door is still open for you. As long as you repent, and this shows how merciful Allah is. As long as you repent and turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will forgive your sins. Even, this is just an example. Even if your sins were to reach the clouds. It doesn't mean go and make sins to reach the clouds. Understand? So no matter what you do, if you repent and turn to Allah, Allah will forgive it. Any sin, Allah forgives. And Allah forgave the one who killed 100 innocent souls. And he forgave the prostitute. So as long as you repent sincerely and there are conditions for the sincere repentance that you quit immediately, you regret and you decide not to go back and if you wrong someone, you ask him forgiveness or if you took someone's money, you have to return it. And fifthly, it has to be this tawbah should be within the uh, acceptable time. Not when you are dying now, you say, I'm making tawbah. Or when the sun rises from the west, you say, I make tawbah. It is too late. So, so there are five conditions for the sincere repentance. So if someone repented sincerely, Allah will forgive him all his sins, irrespective of how much sins he committed. That's what the hadith talks about. It doesn't give green line, go and commit sins. No. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum salam wa what is the punishment for a mu'min who commits suicide? Well, what is mentioned in the hadith that he will be in the hellfire stabbing himself with that tool if he killed himself with a knife, whatever. But this hadith, it is the hadith you have to understand. There is something called a promise and threat, wa'id. There is wa'id and wa'id. The wa'id is what Allah promised. Whatever Allah promised is going to happen. But the wa'id, the threat that Allah threatens, this not necessarily should happen. Are you following? So Allah can forgive the one who committed suicide. It's up to him. So to us, this matter is Allah's. We give him burial wash, and the children inherit him. The wife has to go through the waiting period for months and 10 days, and we ask Allah to forgive him. Whether Allah will punish him, or forgive him, that's up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we cannot say he's going to hell. 
that goes against because it is none of our business. Maybe Allah will forgive him. My dear brothers and sisters and dear viewers, stay tuned. We'll be back inshallah after the break. Welcome back, my dear brothers and sisters and dear viewers. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. What we have summarized from this chapter number two, does it mean that Islam permits to commit sins just because you believe in Allah? Does Islam permit to commit sins? You mean the hadith that Allah forgives the sins even if they reach the clouds? No, it doesn't mean that. This shows the greatness of Allah. This shows the rahmah of Allah. That Allah will forgive you your sins even if they reach the clouds. Which means this will give you hope not to despair and not to give up. So the door is still open for you as long as you repent. And this shows how merciful Allah is. As long as you repent and turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will forgive your sins. Even, this is just an example. Even if your sins were to reach the clouds. It doesn't mean go and make sins to reach the clouds. Understand? So no matter what you do, if you repent and turn to Allah, Allah will forgive it. Any sin, Allah forgives. And Allah forgave the one who killed 100 innocent souls. And he forgave the prostitute. So as long as you repent sincerely, and there are conditions for the sincere repentance, that you quit immediately, you regret, and you decide not to go back. And if you wrong someone, you ask him forgiveness. Or if you took someone's money, you have to return it. And fifthly, it has to be this tawbah should be within the... Uh, acceptable time not when you are dying now you say I'm making tawbah or when the sun rises from the west you say I make tawbah it is too late so, so there are five conditions for the sincere repentance so if someone repented sincerely Allah will forgive him all his sins irrespective of how much sins he committed that's what the hadith talks about it doesn't give green line go and commit sins no Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam wa As you mentioned earlier that hadith weren't compiled during the reign of four imams. I want to know what work did these four imams do for Islam as they have been given a very high status by many Muslims today. Did they compile any such book which is Hasai and can be referred? Actually, I didn't uh, catch what you are saying. You are talking about the four imams? Yes. The four imams, all of them they say, because out of love of the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, and they know that no one is familiar or acquainted with all the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. So they made these statements that if you come across a hadith, authentic hadith, that goes against what I'm saying, follow the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. So this was the four Imams. So now, if you are following one of the four Imam schools and you come across a hadith, that goes against what the Imam said, or what the Imam said is contrary to what the Hadith, you should not follow the Imam and leave the saying of the Prophet And Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he has written a beautiful booklet. Why the scholars, they differ, or the Imams? There are many reasons. Sometimes the Imam, he might have come across this Hadith. The Hadith reached him. But the way he understood the hadith is different. So he interpreted the hadith in a different way. The hadith reached him. Or the hadith reached him and he rejected it. Because to him the hadith is not authentic. It's weak. Are you following? So there are many reasons why the imams might say something that goes against a particular evidence. Either the evidence to them is not authentic or they understood it in their own way. For instance, I'll give an example. You know, the wali for the marriage. For the marriage, a woman should have a guardian or wali. Without the consent of the wali, the father or the brother, the marriage will be invalid. As the Prophet ﷺ said, any woman gets herself married without the consent of the wali, her marriage is invalid, invalid, invalid. And he said it three times. 
So the three Imams, Imam Malik, Imam Ahmad, Imam Shafi'i, Rahimahullah, they consider the Malik invalid. Imam Abu Hanifa, Rahimahullah, he considers the Malik valid. Because the way he understood this hadith, he did not apply it to any woman. He applied the hadith to the slave woman. He said this hadith is applicable in case of the slave. If the girl is slave and got herself married, then the marriage is invalid. But if she is free and the Muslim qadi or judge got her married, the marriage is valid. Are you following? So the hadith reached him, but the way he interpreted and understood it is different from the way the rest of the three imams understood the hadith. Are you following? The three imams, they said, no, this hadith is general because the Prophet ﷺ said, Ayyuma, any woman. So the Prophet ﷺ did not make it specific. To limit this generality of the text, you have to have special evidence. You understand? So you can see now, the strongest opinion in this matter is the opinion of the majority of the schools. That's how the scholars, they differ. I'll give you another example. Where Imam Abu Hanifa, his opinion is the strongest in this issue regarding the Qurbani, the Udhiyah, you know, the sacrifice. The majority of the scholars, they're saying Sunnah Mu'akkada. That means if I don't make a sacrifice, it's okay. Whereas Imam Abu Hanifa is saying it is wajib. You have to if you can afford this financially. And the strongest opinion now is the opinion of Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah. Why? Because there is a hadith that supports him. The Prophet ﷺ said, Man kana du sa'atin ala an yudahi, wa lam yudahi fala yiqrabanna musallana. Whoever is financially able to buy the sacrificial sheep, the qurbani, the sheep, and he didn't offer the sacrifice, he should not come to the Eid. He should not come to our masjid. Are you following? So the Prophet ﷺ is saying, if you can afford buying the Qurbani, you are not allowed to come to the Eid. This means what? It's not only something recommended, it is something obligatory. Otherwise, the Prophet ﷺ would not deprive the person of the attending the Salah. Are you following? You can see now. So that's why always, it's not by the number. It is by who has the strongest evidence. The strongest evidence. Is this clear to you, brother? Difference between hadith say Qudsi and Wahi. The Wahi, the Quran is Wahi. Wahi means to be informed in very subtle way. Okay, that's the meaning of the Wahi. So the Quran was revealed to the Prophet. ﷺ. Allah spoke the Quran and told Jibreel to pass it to the Prophet. ﷺ. Hadith Qudsi, the Prophet ﷺ is not Jibreel will come. No, he gets this feeling. And he received this through the inspiration. And then he phrases it in his own words and attributed to Allah. Whereas the Quran, Allah spoke it. The words of Allah himself through Jibreel and then conveyed to the Prophet ﷺ. So the Quran is the word of Allah. This is the belief of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Min hu bada'u ilayhi ya'ud. Began from him and it will go back. You know, towards the end of time, the Quran will go back. Yes. The people will get up in the morning. They open the Mus'haf, no Quran. In the hearts, no Quran. Everything will go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything will go back to Allah. This will be the last question. Huh? Sir, the kalama. La ilaha illallah appears to be confusing. Sir, please give us some concrete evidence to prove that, to convince non-Muslims that their gods are false gods, they are not worthy of worship, except Allah. No, God except Allah. But here it's not mentioned under the your their gods are not worthy of worship, except Allah is only worthy of worship. It's not elaborated here. It's not reported where? La ilaha illallah. No, it is there. The problem that if you don't know Arabic, you see, I don't want to go to grammar, okay, because this la, we call it la unnafi al jins. It is a negating article. It negates the kind. You know, in Arabic, if I say 
لا رجل في الدار لا رجل في الدار there is no man in the house you know what does that mean I am negating the kind of men even a little boy no man in the house that kind the genus of men is not there so that's why this is called negating article لا النافية للجنس it is an article that negates the genus or the kind so when we say la ilaha it negates all the false deities that's why my dear brothers it is incumbent it is obligatory it is fard upon every muslim to learn arabic without arabic you will not understand your deen your knowledge will remain superficial you are only touching the surface you have to learn arabic and this is the madhab of imam shafi'i so learning arabic is fard and he supported his argument he said there is a famous rule in the sharia ma la yatumu al wajib illa bihi fa huwa wajib the means to accomplish what is obligatory becomes obligatory and explain this to you if the goal if the goal is obligatory fard then the means of achieving that goal becomes it obligatory are you following now salah is obligatory salah is fard in order to pray the salah I, what should i do i have to wear cover my body my aura i have to cover my nakedness now this garment is it a goal or means is this garment a means or goal in itself means it is a means to achieve the goal the goal is the salah the prayer but i cannot pray without covering my aura so this means of covering the aura is this garment so now what is the ruling of buying the garment becomes fard because without it i cannot pray the goal is obligatory then the means becomes what obligatory are you following then buying the garment becomes fard now what is the rule of having a new garment on the Eid day is it fard or sunnah it is sunnah so buying the garment on the new one is sunnah it's not fard are you following now what is the ruling of understanding the deen to understand the deen what's the ruling what is it fard so what is the means that will make it easy for you to understand the deen the language so learning the language becomes fard you got it because without it you will not learn the deen so you have to learn arabic is this clear my dear brothers and sisters inshallah we'll be continuing chapter number three in the coming episode looking forward for that Of the 